and gentlemen, please welcome this evening's guest moderator from Time Out New York, David Fear, and tonight's guest, Pablo Lorraine. Hello. Thank you for sticking around. Um, perhaps I should set the film up for those in the audience that don't speak fluent Spanish. Uh, this film takes place around the 1988 Chilean referendum, which gave Chilean citizens a chance to vote General Augustus Pinochet out of office. And if they voted yes, he would stay in office for an indeterminate amount of time, right? Eight? Eight, Eight more years. And if they voted no, uh, he's out. He's gone. So uh, this is where a very handsome young uh, ad executive played by Gael Garcia Bernal enters in, and he gets hired to work on the No campaign, and he gives it this very flashy Western campaign. So it's the entire notion that the revolution will not be televised, but you can use a really good marketing campaign to sow the seeds of dissent. Uh, I don't know if you are, if everybody here is familiar with Pablo Lorraine's uh, filmography. He's done two really amazing films, which you should check out if you've not seen. One is called Tony Monero, and the other is called Postmortem. And both of those films look at the Pinochet era uh, in very, very dark, very bleak ways. What made you want to look at the end of the Pinochet era through this story? Um, well, thank you for being here tonight. Thanks for the invitation. Um, well, first thing that I'd like to say is that um, the story the real story is amazing. Um, usually, dictators leave the power throughout, you know, a, a blood story, throughout a shootout, throughout whatever. Look at Syria. Look at other countries. And this time, we had our own dictator, and he, after international pressure, he decided to do this referendum. Some people would vote yes or no in order to keep him in power. So it's so original, and 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 at the same time, people would be, um, you know, would have the options to see uh, both sides on TV. And if you think about it, we've been, we have been for over 15 years uh, without freedom of speech. So then we have 15 minutes a day on TV so people can actually tell what's really going on. For a month, right, leading up to the for referendum? 27 days, right. So it's... Um, it was very original, and, and we got involved in the story after the curiosity of how it made. You have to think that um, this is probably the second most important date in the history of our country after the Independence Day is the f October 5th, 1988. It's, it's so important for us. We all grew to... So it's, uh, it's really a national thing, and, and we thought it could be also very interesting for... Um, you know, a, a, a lot of people around the world, and, and we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, obviously, the screenwriter, Pedro Perano? Perano, yeah, it's a hard, it's a tough one, yeah. Uh, he must have done a lot of research going into this script. What sort of research did you do going into this? Well, we, you know, since this is only 24 years ago, um, most of the people who actually did everything is alive, so we had the chance to talk to them. <clears throat> so we did a huge research for over three or four years. So we talked to a lot of people. We we were able to have the the the, the regional footage that was used on, on the campaign. So with that material in our hand, um, Pedro wrote the script, which is was a very long you know uh, sort of process because it, it was very hard to get into the final script, and we shot it. And we shot a movie that it was, it lasts, the first cut lasts over four hours. <clears throat> so we had to, you know, pull it down in 113 minutes, something like that. So it was, it was, uh, we had a, a very long movie because we wanted to put everything inside. And it's not possible, of course. And, and since this is not Kill Bill, we had to put it just in one movie, and that's what we did. I don't know, no part two. It's got kind of a nice ring to it. <laughs> well, I'll t when the box set comes out, right? It's going to call it Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, what, uh, how hard was it to recreate? I mean, you said it's only 24 years ago, but you know, still a lot's changed in Chile since 1988. How, uh, how hard was it to recreate the sort of look and feel of, of that era? Well, the thing is, Estefania Lorrain, who's the, the production design, did a great, great work. Um, she and, and her team um, sort of uh, look all over throughout TV. That's what I ask her. This, since everything was on the screen 
and it's a TV thing somehow. We shot in a TV format from the early 80s, that's why it looks like that. We used uh, analog cameras from, uh, it's a tube cameras, video tube cameras from 1983. And then every reference came from TV. So TV was our sort of our biggest tool. Um, and then the research is, is very possible because you have everything. And when you shoot a movie that is based on, I don't know, and, and like in, in a few centuries ago, you have nothing. Right. Here you have everything. So um, the tough part is that y if you are shooting something and then you're also using archival footage, your own footage will be compared to their archival. So we really had to achieve a very realistic look. <clears throat> Otherwise, people would tell what it's what. And we really wanted to create an illusion so people won't, wouldn't realize if they were looking to archival footage or to the actual footage that we shot. So, uh, How many of these UMATIC cameras are still around? Well, it was very tough. We bought them here. Um, we hired a company in Hollywood who bought uh, almost 20 cameras all over the U.S. and then they assemble out of those 24 and they send us uh, and then every camera would last like 10 days and they would it would die so we had to bring the other one and so it's uh, they, they were those cameras were like persons you know they get cold and then they get hot and then and then they would they would you know they won't just it won't run up and then it would just stop without any reason so it's very hard in terms of technical, because there's no technicians for that. <clears throat> it's over. So it was pretty interesting to work with that material. Uh, when you guys see the film, you'll, you'll realize this, because it takes a couple of minutes for your eyes to adjust to watching what some people might charitably call a cruddy video look. But as the film progresses, I think it adds immensely to the power of the movie, because like you said, you can't tell what's vintage footage. You can't tell what's current. You really feel like you've just been kind of dropped into this time machine and you're right back there at that moment. But surely you must have had some worry after you did tests on these. You're like, people are going to get migraines after watching this for 130 minutes. Well, not only us, but the people that was financing the movie, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were like, hey, we're going to shoot this film in this super low resolution video quality. It has way less resolution than the iPhone that you might have in your pocket. So it's really. It's really old, but it creates this uh, strange image that, that, that you cannot do it in post-production. We tried, but it's not possible. But once we were all, uh, you know, agree with it, um, we just jump into it. And it's, in fact, a lot of people uh, take a while to get used to it. It's because it's hard. It's very ugly, you know? And movies are supposed to be beautiful. You have a DP who take care of that, and, and, in, and what we were trying to do is just to create an illusion. When you see a movie that uses a lot of archival footage, and then they cut to the star, you know, super well photographed, and, and in a super 35 or an HD look, you can immediately realize that that's not the footage, or you know, vice versa. So we wanted to create this illusion, um, and, and we were very focused on that, and and I think it's important, so people won't really understand. We are actually using nearly 30% of the film is archival footage. And that I don't much? think most people don't know it, yeah. Yeah, I would have guessed much less than that. I mean, it's very seamless the way you guys put that together. Uh, you've said in interviews that it actually, the look of the film matches your memories of the time because you said your memories were very, very dirty and very kind of cruddy of Chile at that time. What, what are your memories of the referendum itself? Well, I remember when the, the campaigns were on air, um, it was like when the national football team is playing. There's, a, like, there's no people on the street. You know, everybody's right. watching it, and it's just so huge. And I remember that the Yes campaign uh, was very aggressive and violent and stupid at the same time. And then the No guys came up with this super fresh thing, entertaining, beautiful, accessible, and with fresh ideas. So it's pretty shocking because most people um, wouldn't, were, were not going to vote because they were scared. So this campaign not only made people vote, but also defeat the fear, you know? Because think about it, we had this guy in power for 15 years 
if you said anything against him, they will put you out of the country. If you do it twice, they will just kill you. So it's just, it was really, it, it was a very you know tough situation. And then the no guys, instead of using those 15 minutes a day to tell people how bad was Pinochet, they just said, forget about him. The happiness is coming. Come on, let's do it. And they did it. And, it's, and, and I think they, out of something very ugly, out of something very negative, which is the no option, they didn't have the yes, they had the no. They create something very beautiful and optimistic. And, and we thought that was very universal and interesting to tell in a movie. Yeah, you, ha you had a really great summation line about this, where it was all the, that moment was all about people taking happiness and, and defeating horror with it. I think that just kind of sums it up nicely. Well, Coca-Cola did it 70 years ago, you know? And, and this is, that's why it's so interesting, because this is when the... And it's interesting and delicate, I think, because it's when the political communication gets together with the advertising communication. So you're not selling a product, you're not selling a dream, just you're not selling, you're selling, you know, a, a life, you're selling a society. Um, so if, you, if, you say, if you're saying that a refrigerator will change your life, nobody cares. You know it's a, you know, it's a, it's a freezer, you know, it's something, you, you know. And then if you say, if you, if you look at a, a, a politician saying, he said, I'm going to change your life, it's more dangerous because are you actually going to do it? It's like, you know, and when you do that, so words mean less. After the advertising came into our life, Every word has a, is, has a, a, you know, a different meaning, and it's meaningless. And I think that's, that's in interesting, and it's very dangerous at the same time. Because uh, think about the slogans that you had here with, a, you know, what, what those words really mean. I think there's something in the political communication that comes from the advertising communication that we should take care of, I think. No, I mean, I, no one can tell you what a thousand points of light really is, but it sure sounds great when you hear a politician saying it and he's selling his, his ideology and his campaign. Uh, talk a little bit about filming those commercials, because I think you start with a soda commercial and then you go into the actual campaign. We, we didn't shoot it. That's why, you know, they're the original of commercials. There's footage. Wow. Yeah, you felt, you, you know, you just, yeah, so we you made it. Me. <laughs> We didn't. We didn't show any of that stuff. It's just. So it's those are the actual campaign. Yeah. Commercials. Everything is the original footage. Yeah. Well done, sir. Well done. Yeah. Uh, we're going to show a clip right now. All we'll right. Let people take a nice look at it. Uh, how did Gail Garcia Bernal get involved with this project? Well, we thought in, on him from the very, very beginning. Yeah, um, for a lot of reasons, he's um, an extraordinary performer. I think he's a very, very talented guy. It's not, I mean, it's not. A, I really think so. I, I, I was very shocked when we when we was working with him, and then also because we wanted to make this movie as universal as possible, and a guy like Guy will obviously help in that. So the combination was very good. And also, I discovered something while we were shooting, that he is a very political guy. So he had uh, opinions and ideas that really helped to, the, to make the movie. So it was a very, it was a very good experience. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy and glad that we had him. Uh, he is extraordinary in the film. It's also extraordinary, I think, that even though he's you've gotten a lot of fame doing Hollywood films and American films, he's very well known. He seems remarkably committed to Latin American cinema. And he, he keeps going back, he keeps making these movies in Latin America. He seems huge in promoting it. Well, yeah, I think we're lucky uh, that he does that. Um, yeah, I think he's not behind, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's weird to talk about him, but uh, I mean, I don't think he's behind like uh, fame or money. I think he wants to make the movies that makes him feel good. Um, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's interesting he does that, yeah. Uh, we saw a very brief uh, appearance by Alfredo Castro, who you've worked with on your last two films. How's your working relationship with him changed? Well, he, <clears throat> he's, uh, he, actu he actually is the, is the guy who, 
who uh, taught me in, in school. He has a drama school, and I went there. So he's a very important person in my life. Mm -hmm. So we had this artistic relation and friendship relation for a while. So it was great to have him here. He's always very helpful. And he's an actor who could actually almost do anything. And he could be a funny guy, weird, dark, smart, stupid, whatever. Ask him whatever, and he'll do it. He plays all of those. I mean, in your movies, he plays all of those. Tony Manero, the way he plays that character in Tony Manero is chilling. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen the film, Tony Manero is a film about uh, a disco-obsessed uh, Chilean serial killer. Would that be a pretty accurate description? Yeah, that wants to, he wants to win a TV concert uh, being uh, the Chilean Tony Manero in, you know, Saturday Night Fever's movie? Yeah. So he wants to look like John Travolta, but he's 55 and he lives in Chile, so it's hard. He, he does look good in that white leisure suit, though, I have to <laughs> <Yeah>. say. <laughs> um, what, what do you think the film says about the power uh, of images to affect change? Because, uh, at least in this country, we have a, I think a lot of us have a very negative viewpoint on how marketing and TV and the whole notion of advertising has affected the political process. And this film, I think, is a really great reminder that um, it actually can be used as a, a force of good, that you can actually sort of use this to spur on real change, real positive change. I think it's a movie basically on, on when people get together, really together, and you really want to change something, you can do it. And, I'm, and, and that's the story of this movie. It has a lot of epic elements, and most of the movies, the epic elements comes from the screenwriter's mind, or the producer's mind. They, let's do this epic thing. This time is real. It's a real story. So that, that's why it's so interesting. And then there's something um, that I think is quite dangerous. Like, if you buy any product here or all over in my country, you know, the, the guys who produce that product cannot say something, you know, they cannot lie. You have to say how many fat it has or how many calories. You, if, if you read the ingredients, you will have it. You, 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 you need legally to show all the information. But does the politicians have that? Is anybody regulating what a politician can say or sell to be elected? No. So it's interesting that when, 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 you know, when a politician says anything, you have to accept it. But a product cannot do that. So who's lying here? And I think it's interesting. And again, words mean less every day. But IMATS doesn't. And IMATS is something that you cannot discuss. You can have a different opinion on what it means, but it would stay there. A word could fly like a poem. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the character Rene for a second. He's a composite character of two of the people that worked on the campaign, right? Yeah, good research, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <That's true. laughs> uh, let's talk about those two people that you, that, who's a composite of, because they're both in the film, right? Yeah, they, they both uh, work in the film, they act in the film, uh -huh. but in the yes side. So it was like an internal <laughs> joke. So they, was, they were doing the, the Pinochet uh, sort of campaign. Yeah. Right, one of them's a censor, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. One is a censor, and the other one is, uh, is the one who says that they, they need to do a, sort of a, how do you say, a focus for, to see what people are thinking. Right, like a focus group. Right, a focus group. Yeah. Uh, what sort of stuff did they, when you and Gael met with them, what sort of stuff did they tell you about the campaign? You know, how did they add to the verisimilitude of the, the actual campaigning? Well, it's pretty much in the movie, mm -hmm. most of it. But uh, the problem is that we had to deal with the fact that most of the characters that we had in the script were just one guy. We had one politician, one TV director, one editor, one... Ad ex advertising executive, but the reality is that they were hundreds of people. So you need Robert Altman to make that movie. You know, I, I'm not. You know, I don't have that. You know, the smartness to 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 create a movie with I don't know a hundred characters, which is what actually. So we had to create sim symbols, icons out of each group, and that was very tough. I think that's one of the tougher thing was to to reduce them somehow in just one from each group. Sure. And these guys help a lot on that because they were able to express what was the essential in each one of them. And I think Pedro grabbed that very well and put it on the script. Uh, 
in a way, it feels like when Renee's not just dealing with, you know, working on this campaign, it's like he's coming to grips with the entire history of the country since 1973. There are times in the film where he seems almost sort of, if not ignorant, then almost in denial about what's going on because he seems to live a fairly comfortable life. Well, I, it's something that is very interesting for me, and I've done it in the other two movies. Um, and I think uh, what we have in the three movies, what they share, is that the main character seems to ignore the reality and thinks that by ignoring the reality, he would pass away, he would go through it, and the reality is not going to affect him. And I think you cannot do that in, in life. If you're, like, if you're saying, I don't care if the next president is this one or this one, because whatever I want, you know, it would affect you. You cannot deny the reality of your country, the political situation. If you do that, if you avoid that, it will affect you in an unknown way. And I think those movies, in my very private way of looking at things, uh, are based on what you just asked. The fact that the guy denies the reality or seems to be away from it is what finally caused him some kind of a damage. It's interesting, too, because if you look at your f the characters in your first two movies, the two that you're talking about in the trilogy, um, they don't really ever, their eyes never really seem to open, it feels like. Or when they do, it, it just it brings about these really horrible negative. It's negatives. too late. Yeah, it's too late at that point. Whereas this, it feels like it's just in time for this guy. Yeah, I think you. I think, as a you know, as a social people, as people that lives in community, we need to be aware of who is who and who is taking decisions in your country. Who is actually your politician? If you don't care and you say oh, I don't care, it would affect you somehow. So you have to be responsible, because um, I don't know. A, a lot of people from my generation that I grow up. Um, would usually say that I don't care about it, and somehow they would be affected. In, and, and I thought it was very interesting. Uh, the reception that this has been getting at festivals as it's playing, especially at Con where it premiered, has been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, are you surprised? Because even though it it deals, it's a universal film. It deals with a very specific moment in a very specific country's history. Well, yes, of course, uh, we were very surprised. Uh, the reaction was uh, pretty amazing, and, and we were able to sell the movie to a lot of countries, which is something that I'm not the kind of filmmakers that want to keep the movies in the closet. Uh, right. I, 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 because, you know, believe it or not, there's a lot of them, you know. Yeah, but you make them to, to show them, sure. Yeah, they want to make the movie and they just leave it as a, you know, in, in somewhere. But, um, of course, we didn't expect that. Uh, movies uh, are made in a very private way, in the lab somehow, and then you just go out without any idea on what the reaction will be. And so you are always really nervous. And, and tomorrow we'll screen the movie here, the New York Film Festival, and we will be, be very nervous anyway. <laughs> every premiere, every first time you show it, it's a very interesting, beautiful moment. And, and um, I don't know, it's just so interesting to see what people think about it. There was this wonderful moment I had when I saw the film where uh, it ended and everybody stood up and they gave the film a standing ovation and people were screaming, no, 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 so happily. <laughs> uh, we're going to open it up to Q&A. Who wants to ask some questions? Just raise your hand and wait for the mic to come to you, please. Hi there. I have a bit of a cold, but <laughs> so excuse me. Um, you mentioned that you incorporated some of the original footage from when it actually happened, and I was wondering if you ever had any legal problems with um, incorporating that footage, or what kind of uh, struggles you went through to get the footage? Well, um, well, you buy them most of the time, and the ones that we didn't buy, we got them from the people who actually shot them, so either they had a price, like every minute will cost you something, or they would, we, we got them from the people who did it and wanted to support the movie. So, and then there's other stuff that is on public domain because it was aired as a, a political campaign. So 
It's um, maybe it's a producer camp question. My brother the produces around here, but I could tell you pretty much that it's like that. Yeah. Was it hard to track some of that stuff down? Yeah, it was very hard to get them in a good quality too, because there's a lot of stuff in YouTube, a lot of stuff and and I don't know in different formats, but. Uh, they didn't look uh, very well, most of it, so we have to work over it. Um, unfortunately, in my country, we don't have a, a very sort of um, ar like archival culture. We don't keep the footage uh, very well, so it was hard for us to reach out all the material. But we, we finally did it, and I think thanks... Uh, to some people who does take care of it, and actually they they digitalize it some of it. So, yeah. Next question is going to be right here to your left. In the film, now you show the uh, inner structures of the governmental bodies, how they work, and you try to make it relevant to uh, viewers nowadays. It kind of reminds me of uh, the Greek filmmaker Costa Gavras. I don't know if that was an influence. If not, what are some films or directors that influence you to make this film? Well, it's a, <clears throat> it's a tough question. Of course, I admire Costa Gavras. And, but um, I've been influenced by a lot of directions in, in different moments of my life. I wouldn't say that I, I got a specific influence uh, by any specific director to this movie. Um, I've been close to or obsessed in really uh, with a lot of people, um, directors, not, you know, and, and filmmakers. Um, so it's it's a very hard. Uh, we were trying to track down movies that used archival footage, and and you know original footage, without uh, being able to understand what is what. And it was very tough, you know. I don't think uh, we weren't really able to do it. Uh, I spoke with a lot of people who knows a lot of movies, and, and it was very hard. Um, so it was hard to get an influence. Most of that stuff usually is in documentaries. And I love documentaries, but we are making fiction here. So um, it was a very interesting process to, to create this, this movie. I would argue there's a lot of Billy Wilder in this. It felt a lot like watching a Billy Wilder movie. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a possibility. Um, there's you know there, there's a movie, this a Swedish documentary that is in Criterion. that's called Yellow. Have you you know that? I am curious. Yellow. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I think uh, because sometimes uh, people th think that inspiration would come from things that are similar to your work, but c when you create something you transform something that you are imitating somehow. So the process, I think, is to imitate first, then to change it, and then to create something new. But you start abusing for some, somebody else's work, <laughs> then it would become something so unique, and then it's yours. That's the process, I think. And I, and I think it's necessary to assume that you're not creating something out of nothing. You're starting from out of a lot of filmmakers that have made wonderful movies, you have a footage, you have a story that is real, then you transform it and you make it on your own. And hopefully you're bringing something personal to it as well. Of course, but it happens when you're honest with it. Right. If, you cr if you're trying to create a product, it, it would usually end up really bad, I think. If you're honest on it, it would, it would become something unique on time. Next question's right here to your left. Hello, um, I want to know about, because when you talk about movies, of course you think about uh, United States, they made a lot of good movies, and we, like I am from Brazil, and I already see a lot of movies talking about uh, American history. And now you did a Latin America film talking about a uh, story there, and you said that people are liking, and you were trying to do this more universal. Do you think the moment is changing for Latin American movies? They are, they are more universal, as you said, or is because I don't know. Like your film is so good that it, it doesn't matter. They will like anyway. Do you understand? <laughs> well, um, I, I think it's a great moment for Latin American movies. I agree with that. I think it's um, a lot of interesting filmmaking, and very diverse. 
And I think the recipe of that success is that we drop the recipes. I think people today is making movies that are quite original. And for a while, we were doing movies that, not all of them, but, but a few trying to make movies that would imitate some other films. So once we create our own ideas and we were able to expose them on a film, we became an interesting cinematography you know, on the world. I think there's a lot of attention uh, over Latin American movies uh, thanks to, to their originality and somehow to the honesty of the people that is behind them. Right here by the wall. Um, I wanted to know, like, what point in the writing process did you figure out that, like, you had to simplify all these characters so that it wasn't, like, so many people? At the very, very beginning, yeah. We realized that there was just a lot of people behind it, and it was just not possible, we, you know, to, to make a movie with all these characters. So we had to create symbols out of each group, but it was at the, at the very beginning. Thank you. Right here in the back. Hi, thank you. It's, it's been great to hear your views. Um, last year, Chile was in the news a lot because of the student protests. So I was curious to know what was the reaction in Chile of, of this movie, and particularly among the youth, who not necessarily leave this referendum. Well, it's, it's very polarized. You know, My country still has, uh, is very divided in which kind of social project or political project we are looking for. So the reactions were very polarized too. What it what it was interesting, I guess, is that a lot of people, even in the film criticism and and, and, and this specialized world, um, was very hard for them to separate, you know, the reality of their own experience during those those days with the film. So they it was hard for them to see the fiction of it, and. A lot of people would keep having an opinion out of what what actually happened, and it was hard for them to get close to the you know to the metaphor that we were showing, or to the fiction. And a lot of people didn't like it, which is reasonable. And a lot of people did like it. Um, it was very good on, on the box office, and and it was a very interesting the debate that we had, uh, because we had the chance to have opinions for former presidents for the actual president, for politicians, people from advertising, people from marketing. So we create a very interesting little debate for a while in our country. Um, but it, what it, it was interesting is that like young people, people who, like the students, most of the students who were on the street last year um, making this amazing uh, sort of protest and actually creating some changes. Um, when they see Pinochet on screen, they, most of the, them will laugh, you know, because they look at him as a funny guy, uh, like a, a guy coming out of a comic, you know, like a, like a dark, bad, evil person. But it's not real. It's just so bad, it's not, not real. But the people that actually did live it, when, when we see Pinochet on screen, it's just so frightening. Even though it could be funny, you know, it's frightening. So the reactions are very connected with their own experience. So I would say that it's so different. I couldn't say that there's just one reaction or two. There's thousands of reactions. And blogs, critics, Twitter, Facebook, everything was so different. So um, if you want to take a look, it will take you a while to try to make one idea. This is it's quite hard. It's complicated. We have time for two more questions. One of them's right here in the back, in the middle. Uh, <clears throat> I have two questions. The first one is, how did you get your start in filmmaking? And two, what would you recommend to somebody who's beginning to become a filmmaker or pursuing that career? Oh, I'm not good on that, man. I'm sorry. Um, I, would, I would say that if you want to make, um, make a movie, um, you shouldn't complain if you're not able to do it. Because you can grab a camera today and make an amazing movie with your friends in your house. So I think movie making is very easy and accessible today. And there's nothing against you to make a movie. Not even, if, if, if you were living 
in Cuba, I would tell you, May, maybe you, have, you will have a problem if you want to talk about Fidel, you know? But if you're here or in any other country in this world, you will be able to make the movie you want to do if you, if you have the passion. I think it's just work. And I started um, in, 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 this, uh, in, in, in this career just trying to make movies. And my first movie, it's a movie that it's a very ambitious and pretentious movie that wanted to, you know, uh, to be the best movie ever made. And I guess that's a problem, because you try to make a huge film. You, you want to make all the movies that you want to do right now in one film. And that is not a good idea. I think good movies came as, out of think, simple things that you could be able to transform in something that it could be emotional and in interesting for others. I think small things can be big on a movie. And that's my biggest lesson in this, in this career. We have time for one last question. It's over here to your right, way over here on the end. If you would stand up. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I have a question about translation. So as you disseminate the movie to other countries and you know it's being translated into different languages, I'm wond wondering if that's something that worries you, that something is going to get lost in translation, or is that something you don't get involved with? Thank you. Well, I do in, in, in English. I don't speak any other language but Spanish and English. and so. Of course, it's important. And, but what I do is that I try, when we were shooting, and that I try to keep the words that are able to be translated. Um, because some, we speak uh, very weird Spanish in my country, and we use a lot of metaphors to express ourselves. Um, so it's very hard to translate that, because it's a metaphor. It's a concept. You know, It's not a word. So um, when, when we were shooting, I was worried about it. And then we have the help of the people that we work with here in France. Um, the, f the, f the people that actually produce the movie comes from the United States, from France. And so they will always um, making good comments on the script and then on the editing. You know, we, we send the first guy and they will say, what is this? I don't get it. So we'll fix it because we wanted to make it an understandable international film. So it was very... Uh, good to have those opinions before we finish the movie. But I think it's important. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about it. Thank you so much for coming and for uh, your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.